This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, the story of a crime against the community, bank robbery. According to the 19th century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, only the weak man is moral. The strong man, the superior man, is above morality. As the basis of the Nazi religion of the Superman, this philosophy produced a nation of gangsters. It can make a criminal out of any human being who permits his ego to feed upon it. Tonight's case is the story of a young man who made the Nietzsche philosophy his religion. A highly intellectual youth with an extraordinary educational background. He was precocious as a child, cynical as an adolescent, and now, well, our story opens at a cabin resort on a lake in northern Illinois. It is nearly sundown. Philip Houston and his young bride of a week are strolling along the lake shore. It's going to be a lovely sunset, Philip. The storm would be even more beautiful. You know, nature is never more beautiful than when she's angry. When the thunder rolls and rumbles and crashes and lightning cuts a gash across the sky. The wild wind and rain beat against the house and smash trees to earth. And swollen streams become raging torrents. And leap over their banks. And crush everything in their way. Phil. Yes? I love storms, too. That's part of what I've been talking to you about the past three days. The beauty of power, of force. Remember what I've said? Remember? To annihilate that which is weak, imperfect, ugly, and to build instead that which is strong, perfect, beautiful. And that then makes the act of annihilation itself beautiful. Yes. Oh, look. Look, Skippy's come down to the shore to meet us. Well, hello, Skippy fella. How are you? Oh, you're the silly Della? looking animal I ever saw. Della. <laughs> yes? You might as well test yourself right now on a very important lesson. What do you mean, Phil? I've told you, you must have no emotional attachments for anybody or anything. Quiet, Skippy. That kind of love is weakness. It rules the one who indulges it. You must overcome it now. Here, take this pistol. Why? Take it. Phil, you don't mean you're asking me... The strong me must be ready and able to inflict suffering or death upon any enemy of his strength. Phil! Shoot that dog, Della. No. No. You're forgetting the lesson of obedience, too. No, no, Phil, I can't, All right, I can't. give me the pistol. Phil, no, no! <laughs> oh. oh, no, Phil, no. When you've gotten hold of yourself, Della, <laughs> come on to the cabin. Mr. Houston! Mr. Houston! Oh, good evening, Mrs. Shaw. Oh, I, I heard a shot. I thought it came it from... It did. Down. I had to shoot Mrs. Houston's dog. You had to... Oh, but... Why? I'd like to settle my bill now, Mrs. Shaw. We're leaving before dawn. We have an appointment some distance away. To the disciple of the rule of force, that which is an enemy of strength must be annihilated. The dog provoked affection, affection is weakness. Therefore, Philip Houston destroyed the dog. As for the appointment he and Della had some distance away, it is two minutes after nine o'clock the next morning. The Freeport, Illinois National Bank has just opened its doors for business. 
It is a small bank and only one teller is on duty at the moment. He is counting his supply of currency when he becomes aware of a shadow across the counter and looks up into the muzzle of a pistol. Excuse me, Mr. Teller. Uh, what? Uh, this is a hold-up. Uh, uh, yes, it sort of looks that way. And if you're reaching with your foot for the alarm pedal, don't bother. Oh. Now, um, put all your money in this bag. Here. Very well. And don't worry about the rest of the staff. They're under the watchful care of the young lady over there with a the submachine gun. You... you won't get away with this. That's what you've told yourself so often, isn't it? You're envious of my courage to do the thing you've often been tempted to do yourself. It's the fear of apprehension that keeps most people honest. And put in those tens, too. Very well. Most people are weak, and they make laws to make a virtue of their lack of courage. There. All right. Give me the bag. Here you are. Thank you. You've cooperated splendidly. I, I st still say you won't get away with this. Mr. Teller, none of us lives this life forever. But it's far better to live it courageously than cowardly. Philip Houston, the Superman, and his bride escaped with $20,000 in cash plus securities. A few minutes after the robbery, the Chicago office of the FBI was notified, and Special Agent Cameron went to work. At the bank, employees gave him a good description of the couple, but there were no other clues at the scene. Houston had been careful to leave no fingerprints, and no one had seen which way the bandit car left town. With the aid of the local police, Cameron began combing the country over a wide radius. And it was the next afternoon when he reached the lake resort and questioned the owner, Mrs. Shaw. The descriptions check all right, Mrs. Shaw. And you say Philip Houston and his wife left here about dawn the morning of the robbery? Yes, sir. That would have given them time enough to reach Freeport and get set for the robbery, all right. Here's something that might help. What's that? Well, after the way he killed that dog, I got suspicious of such a mean man and took down his auto license number. Good for you. It's on this slip of paper. Here it is. Hmm. A Michigan license. Uh, Mrs. Shaw, I'd like to look at the register he signed when they checked in. All right. Oh, but he had me sign for them. Oh? Careful not to leave any fingerprints, wasn't he? Of course. I never thought of that at the time, but... Wait a minute. Yes? When I was cleaning up after they left, I found a book he'd left behind the bed. It must have fallen over without him knowing it. May I... I have it, please? It's right here on the desk. Here you are. Hmm. Ecce homo. I couldn't make head nor tails of it. It's in some foreign language. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of books that didn't make much sense to me, even in English. This but... one's in German. The work of the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And it explains a lot about our Mr. Philip Houston. You don't say. Yes. And I'm pretty sure we'll find some fingerprints that might tell us a lot more. That night, Special Agent Cameron contacted the Detroit FBI office and requested a check on the Michigan license number of the bandit car. Also, he airmailed to Washington fingerprints he found in the book. Next morning, there was another bank robbery a hundred miles south of Chicago. And that afternoon, found Houston and Della hiding in the barn of an abandoned farm. Della? Yes? From now on for a while, we'll hide out by day and travel by night. Until we get where we're going. Where are we going, Phil? You'll know when we get there. And after that, we'll take off time for some real fun. But, darling, the police will still be looking for us. And we'll still be outwitting them. Now, you curl up and get some sleep. I'll keep watch. No, I... I'm not sleepy. Della? Yes? Look in this bag. That's over $30,000. I know. Money is power, Della. Power to do whatever you want to do. Go everywhere you want to go. Have everything you want to have. I know, Phil. What I... chance? What, what chance would you have for this back home? Huh? Scrubbing and cooking. 
scrimping and saving, moving in a circle that gets tighter and tighter until it chokes the very breath of life out of you. Do you want that? Of course not. No. You and I have got to be free souls. And our freedom is in this bag. It's full now, Della. And it's going to stay that way. Because we're smart enough and strong enough to keep it full. Do you understand? Yes, Phil. Della soon dropped off to sleep, and Philip Houston relaxed with a book. But his Superman self-assurance would have been a little disturbed had he known what was taking place in the Chicago office of the FBI. Cameron speaking. Hello, Cameron. Murphy, Detroit. Oh, hello there. Have you got something on that Michigan license? Yes. It's a 1938 black Buick sedan. Bought two weeks ago from a used car dealer. Mm -hmm. And re-registered under the name of John Weatherford. Any description of Weatherford? It checks with your man, Houston. All right. Motor number? Uh, 6323930. Got it? 9300. Right. I'll put out a five-state alarm on it right away. Thanks a lot. Busy, Leo? No. What have you got, George? Teletype from Washington. The fingerprints on the book have been identified. Good. They belong to Philip Windsor, who served time in Kansas State Reformatory. And the description is that of so-called Philip Houston. Well, Mr. Windsor better pray for a quick, cool spell. His trail's getting hot. <laughs> We momentarily close the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on Philip Windsor, bank robber. We'll return to this case in just a moment. As you read today's newspapers, you undoubtedly experienced a profound feeling of satisfaction when you noted how quickly America has begun to return to the ways of peace. Already a number of the restrictions that were necessary in time of war have been lifted. Others will soon be removed. Business, as well as government, is playing an important role in hastening this return to normal living conditions. And in the forefront of this movement is the management of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. During the war, it was necessary to exclude certain war risks from newly issued life insurance policies. But yesterday, one day after hostilities ended, Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, announced that the society would discontinue effective immediately the war clauses in life insurance policies hereafter issued. This means that Americans, even if now serving in the Army or Navy, can now buy an Equitable Society policy that contains no restrictions as to war risks. Just as the Equitable Society is alert to peacetime opportunities to improve and liberalize its life insurance services to the public, so its funds will continue to work in ways that benefit the country as a whole. Equitable Society dollars, the result of the work, thrift, and savings of the American people, will continue to be invested in the great industries which are now converting to peacetime production to provide jobs for our returning servicemen. Yes, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on Philip Windsor, bank robber. Criminals are not always products of an underprivileged childhood. Many of them had more than comfortable homes, and many of them received the advantages of an excellent education. What caused them to turn to crime? Some started out merely seeking new thrills. Others? Well, let's go on with the story of the young man in tonight's case, whose real identity has been established as Philip Windsor. The FBI now knows that Windsor and his wife are driving a 1938 black Buick sedan, Michigan license. And so far, 
maybe as a kind of dare, are operating only in the limited area of Illinois. Hi, George. Oh, come in, Leo. Any report from that alarm on Windsor's car? Not yet, but here's a file on him from the Kansas Reformatory. He got ten years for a Kansas robbery, but was paroled after two. Yes, I see. Thanks to a good family background. His father was a university professor. Uh Uh-huh. In a nutshell, Windsor was a precocious kid who eventually became contemptuous of everything normal and conventional. And overripe for the power philosophy of old Frederick Nietzsche. Exactly. Come in. This teletype just came in. Thanks, Ruth. Well, what is it? A report from Belleville. The police down there found Windsor's Buick in a local garage an hour ago. I see. He left it there to have the motor overhauled and rented a Ford from him to use while the car was being fixed. Hmm. In other words, he just traded cars. Yes. The Belleville police have already sent out an alarm on the Ford. You think Windsor's going out of sight for a while? It looks that way. And the safest place to do that would be at some friend's house. Yes. Let's get a wire off to the Kansas Reformatory. I want to know just who Windsor's friends are. It was at about this same time, shortly after dark, that Philip Windsor and his wife, Della, slipped out of a cheap rooming house in East St. Louis, down in southern Illinois, got into the Ford sedan and drove rapidly out of the city and headed north. In a few hours now, Della, we'll be in Chicago. Then what? Then I'll contact my friend Kingston, and he'll give us a safe haven for as long as we need it. Personally, Phil... I would like to hurry up and get some of that freedom you were talking about. Well, we have it right now. You call this freedom? Aren't we doing the things we set out to do? Aren't we living our own lives in our own way? I don't call having to hide out by day and slip around by night freedom. And knowing that the police are constantly looking for us, I don't call that freedom either. I don't want to be disappointed in you, Della. Disappointed? I chose you because I thought you had strength and courage. Have I shown anything else? Your behavior right now is a sign of weakness. I'm just tired of running and hiding. That's all part of the game, Della. But we don't call it running and hiding. Those are cowardly words. What do we call it, then? This is a game that requires consummate courage, daring, and skill. And in every game, there are offensive moves and defensive moves. Of course, We have committed two offensive moves. Now we are meeting the inevitable counterattack with defensive measures. Don't you see? Yes, yes, I see. State Highway Patrol. What do we do? Just keep calm and leave the rest to me. Pull over to the side and stop. Yes, sir. your own car? Yes, sir, my own car. And my own brand new wife. We're on our way home from a little honeymoon trip, and we... Let me see your license. Oh, marriage or car license? I don't inspect marriage licenses. All right. My car license is in my bag in the back seat. I'll get it for you. Was I going too fast, officer? I'm not interested in that angle now. Ah, here it is. Here you are, officer. <clears throat> Phil. That's one counterattack repulse, Della. Yes, one counterattack repulsed. But another was about to form in the FBI's Chicago office. It is nearly midnight, and Special Agent Cameron, who went out for a bite of food while waiting for the report from the Kansas Reformatory on Windsor's friends, is re-entering the office. Did that report come in yet, George? Yes, and so did another one. What do you mean? Windsor slugged a highway patrolman who stopped him on the road out of East St. Louis about 9 o'clock. Which way was Windsor headed? Right here, Chicago. What's the report on his friends? After he got out of the reformatory, he corresponded regularly with a Marvin Kingston who was still in. But he's out now. Where? Chicago. And here's the address. Good. Keep your fingers crossed, George. This may be the beginning of the payoff. A 
three days, FBI agents kept a close watch on Marvin Kingston and his house. But Windsor made no contact with Kingston by person or by phone or by mail. Then on the afternoon of the fourth day, at the corner grocery a block from Kingston's house, an attractive young blonde came out of the store with a small sack of groceries. She spoke to a little girl rolling a doll buggy. Hello, honey. Hello. Do you know where Mr. Kingston lives? Uh Uh-huh, right down there. Well, if you'll deliver this sack of groceries to Mr. Kingston in your doll buggy, I'll give you a whole dime. Do you want to? Sure. Where's the dime? (laughs) Here you are. Thank you. And there are the groceries. And tell your dolly to hold on to them tight now, won't you? Oh, she will. Thank you, honey. Goodbye. Bye. Now, Rosemarie, you hold on to that sack good, like the pretty lady said. Hold on, we're going now. The little girl reached Kingston's house and was about to take the sack from the buggy and start up the front walk when Special Agent Cameron intercepted her. What have you got there, little girl? In the sack? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not mine. It's for Mr. Kingston. Oh. A pretty lady gave me a whole dime to bring it here. Really? Uh Uh-huh. I wonder what's in it. Can I take a look? Well, just one. But you can't have any of whatever it is. (laughs) I promise not to touch anything. All right. Then take just one little peek now. Mm Mm-hmm. Well. Thank you. Now, go ahead and deliver the sack. Agent Cameron watched until the girl had delivered the sack and gone. Then he went up to the house and introduced himself to Marvin Kingston. I'm Special Agent Cameron of the FBI. What do you want with me? There was a message in that sack of groceries from Philip Windsor. What makes you think so? You're on parole, Kingston. Do you want to face a charge of conspiracy? All right, here's a note. Winter wants me to meet him at 8 o'clock tonight at Joe's Hamburger Stand on Euclid Avenue. But you'll have to stay here. The FBI will meet Philip Windsor. At 7.30 that night, several FBI agents joined Cameron and took up positions at various points outside the hamburger stand. Promptly at 8 o'clock, a car drove up and parked half a block away. Philip Windsor and his wife got out, walked to the hamburger stand, and went in. The agents saw them order soft drinks. Minutes passed. Windsor grew restless. Finally, at 8.15, he spoke to Della quietly. Something must have gone wrong. I'm sure the little girl delivered the sack with a note. Maybe Kingston wasn't at home to get it. Oh, shall we take a chance and call him? No. Drink your soda. I don't want any more. What are you nervous about? What are you? I'm not nervous. I've never seen you act this way before. I tell you, I'm not... I'm not nervous. Well, I am. I've got a funny feeling. Shut up. And so have you. Shut up, I tell you. Come on, let's get out of here. Where are we going? Let's get out of here, I said. Come on. Go ahead. All right. Come on, back to the car. Phil. What's the matter? Stop where you are, both of you, and raise your hands. Not for anybody. Phil! Don't reach for your gun, Windsor, with the FBI. Phil, don't! You're his wife, Della? I'm sorry. It didn't have to end this way, you know. Yes, I'm afraid it did. It never could have ended any other way for Phil. Philip Windsor had no respect for law-abiding citizens. He said... It is far better to live courageously than cowardly. And saying that, he showed his contempt for those of us who lead conventional lives. 
Philip Windsor would have been smart to have looked at the record of this nation at war. Because the courage of conventional ordinary people has been proven on every battlefield. Freedom from tyranny was won on those battlefields for you, the law-abiding conventional citizen of the world. And freedom from criminal aggression is being won for you here in America by the special agents of the FBI. The special agents who every day prove he who lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. That's the way the Bible puts it. And the history of the world has shown how right the Bible is. You'll hear the disposition of this case in just a moment. Did you know that in a single battleship of the United States Navy, there are more than 900 electric motors, a thousand different electrical instruments, 1,100 telephones, 1,600 electronic tubes, and a wiring system 1,700 miles long? All that on one battleship. That gives you an idea of the tremendous wartime assignment that the electrical manufacturing industry received from Uncle Sam. Radar, automatic plane pilots, smoke generators, sound detectors, range finders. These are only a few of the thousands of complex electrical products supplied an enormous quantity to our armed forces. So will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to the electrical manufacturing industry and its one million employees? Theirs has been an outstanding job of war production, a credit to the industry and to the American system under which that industry flourishes, and a promise of better living for all of us in the peaceful years to come. For many years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has regarded electrical manufacturing as a sound and safe field for the investment of Equitable Society funds. So millions of Equitable Society dollars have been invested in electrical manufacturing as well as in scores of other great industries which were mobilized for war production. In wartime, Equitable Society dollars have been fighting dollars. And at all times, they are security dollars for you, your home, and your country. After the death of her husband, Della Windsor was convicted for her part in the bank robberies and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. The incidents used in tonight's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries. Your narrator was Frank Lovejoy. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company.